Well, good morning. morning. To the online Golden Corner family, good morning. Thanks for joining us today. And to those to the Golden Corner family gathered here in the room, good morning. See a lot of new faces. See a lot of familiar faces. You almost said I see a lot of old faces. You say I caught that? No, I didn't say that. (laughs) See a lot of familiar faces. It's good to see you today. I come this morning with a very simple message, but a very important message that applies to each and every one of you who consider yourselves to be a Christian, a believer. It's a message that I know that God has put on my heart and said, you go share it with them. Maybe they don't know this. Maybe they need to be reminded of it. But here it goes. You ready? If you don't get anything else, you're going to get this, right? You got your pen. You're going to be able to take notes. You ready? Here's the message. You're not alone. Did you get it? Good, I'm glad I was here today. I appreciate you being here. And, uh, <laughs> easiest money I ever made, right there, you know. <laughs> You're not alone. When you sleep or when you can't. When the hospital door closes and your last visitor leaves. When the funeral service ends and everybody else moves on with their life, you're not alone. When your spouse walks out, the kids don't come, the phone never rings, and your house is filled with deafening silence. You're not alone. When you're that close to succumbing to temptation or facing a complex problem or making an extremely difficult decision, you're not alone. When the giant you thought you overcame gets back on his feet, When you are outnumbered, overwhelmed, and reaching for the white flag, please pause and remember this. You are not alone. Not for one moment of one day of your life are you alone. I believe this might be the greatest oversight on the part of believers in this generation. We keep forgetting that the Holy Spirit lives within us. You with me? We keep forgetting that the Holy Spirit lives within us, and because He is in us, we are never alone. Now, just who is the Holy Spirit? And, And who is He to us? The night before Jesus' crucifixion, He gathered His 11 men around, His disciples, and He gave them some bad news. He was leaving. Then he gave him worse news. You can't follow me. Not yet. As you can imagine, these men were deeply confused. They believed he was the Messiah, the King of the Jews. He's going to straighten out all their problems. And now you're cutting out on us? Uh, I think they were confused. How does this... How does it make any sense with your plan for us? You called us to follow you, and now you're saying we can't follow you? I think it was devastating. They were very, very close friends. And I believe it was frightening. I tell you, resistance was at a boiling point against Jesus. And I believe these men did the math and realized if he's gone, all that's going to be directed toward us. Jesus immediately recognized, Chris, my men, they still need a lot of help. So he promised them a helper. Let's read about it. John chapter 14, verse 16 through 18 Jesus said to his distraught men, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He just said, I'm going to leave you. He won't. And then he identifies who this new advocate is going to be, the Holy Spirit, 
who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later, look at this, will be in you. Now to comfort these guys, Jesus promised them another advocate. Now what is an advocate? The Greek word translated into our English word, advocate, in the New Living Translation of the Bible is paraclete. Are you fascinated now by my mastery of the Greek language? You, fa you fascinated by that? Thank you, Kil Kilty. Thank you. In the King James Version of the Bible, it is translated as comforter. In the Holman Christian Standard Bible, it is translated as counselor. In the English Standard Version of the Bible, it is translated as helper. An advocate is someone who comes alongside of another to help out. They console, they counsel, they encourage, they lend support in times of trouble. They provide whatever is needed to make the completion of a task easier. Jesus had been serving as the advocate for these men, and now he's telling them, I'm leaving. I'm going to ascend back to heaven. So he promised, this is what he's promising, the Holy Spirit is going to pick up where I leave off. He'll be your new advocate, your new comforter, your new counselor, your new helper. And just who is the Holy Spirit? Are you ready now? Because here, here we go. We're, we're going to enter into some theology. And, and theology sometimes is equal to ambient. I mean, it just knocks people out cold. You know what I mean? So here, pr pray a little prayer and say, help me get this. This is important because he's the one that lives in you. So just who is he? The Bible teaches that our God is a trinity. He's one God who operates, manifests himself in three distinct personalities. You know who they are? Father, Son, Spirit. Don't ask me to explain all the details of this biblical revelation. All I know is this is the way God has chosen to reveal himself on the pages of the Bible. And I believe it. And I accept it. Which means the Father is God. And the Son is God. And yes, the Spirit is also God. Which means he possesses all the attributes and characteristics of the Father and the Son. He loves with an unconditional, unfailing love. The one who lives in you. He is rich in mercy and full of grace. His knowledge is infinite. He knows everything about everything including the future. He sees your future as perfectly as you see the moment. His power is unlimited. He can do anything. He can do anything that's impossible for you is simple for him. He can vanquish any foe. He can meet any need. The Holy Spirit would be to these men everything Jesus had been to them. And get this, you know what Jesus said? More. Because there's going to come a point where he moves inside your body. He's going to live in you. He won't be the helper alongside you. He'll be the helper within you. And when he moves in, he will make his residence in you permanent. He will never leave you. Well, the next day, these 11 men watched a nightmare unfold. Jesus was arrested, tried, and found guilty of crimes he didn't commit. He was beaten, executed, and buried in a borrowed tomb all before the sun went down. But you know, how the, you know how the story ends, don't you? Three days later, he rose from the dead, walked out of the tomb, rejoined the living, and he spent 40 days with his followers before returning to heaven. After Jesus ascended, the believers waited for their new helper, capital H. And as they waited, they constantly prayed together. Ten days after Jesus departed, the believers were praying together when something of eternal significance took place. And man, you got to read it to believe it. You ready to read it? Acts chapter 2, verse number 1. We're going to read all the way through verse 8. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers would meet together in one place. 
Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm. And it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. Let me tell you what was going on. Pentecost was a big deal, big Jewish holiday. There were Jews from at least 15 different countries who spoke the native language of those countries who had come to Jerusalem at, at kind of a pilgrimage. And so they got all these Jews who speak all these foreign languages and they're gathered there. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running, and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. They were completely amazed. How can this be, they exclaimed. These people are all from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. How can they do that? What just happened? Just as he had promised, Jesus sent the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit indwelt every believer. And once the Spirit indwelt them, He filled them. And once He filled them, He began to help them. Wasn't that what He's supposed to do? Once He indwelt them, He filled them. And once He filled them, He began to help them. In this case, He began to help them fulfill their mission. He gave them the supernatural ability to speak fluently in languages unknown to them, but known to others. Hence, language bearers are broken down, and people were hearing about God and all the wonderful things that he had done. Well, a huge crowd gathered. Curious about the windstorm, curious about these people's, uh, you know, uh, miraculous ability to speak 15 different languages just like that. The apostle Peter recognized only the Spirit of God could have created an opportunity like this. So he began to preach. He preached the good news of Jesus, told about his birth, told about his life, told about his death, his resurrection, and about the, about the salvation that he now offered. And then he gave people an opportunity to accept Christ. What happened next? I mean, you think the windstorm was a miracle? You think the tongues of fire were a miracle? The ability to all of a sudden speak in these languages, that's a miracle. I tell you, the greatest miracle happened when Peter opened up the altar and said, anybody want to be saved? 3,000 people were saved. Now remember, this was the first time they ever tried anything like that. They never tried this before. They had no experience at outreach, missions, evangelism. They didn't have air conditioning. They didn't provide any comfortable seating. They didn't own a building or any real estate of their own. Hey, that morning, they didn't even have a band to start things off with. They didn't have a sound system, a video projection system. They didn't have a Christian radio station or TV station. They didn't have the internet. They didn't do a live stream. They didn't have a YouTube channel. They didn't have any form of social media whatsoever. They didn't have a children's curriculum for the teachers to follow. They didn't have computers or software or iPhones or apps. They didn't have Christian schools, colleges, or seminaries. And get this, Ernie, they didn't even have the New Testament. And yet they reached 3,000 people the first time they ever tried outreach. Most churches would never reach 3,000 people in their existence. And they did it without all the things we've come to depend on, the things we've come to rely on. How could that be? The Holy Spirit helped them. Now with this continued help, tens of thousands of people in Jerusalem alone were saved. And then the Holy Spirit began to call out and send out missionaries from this church in Jerusalem so that so many people were saved across Asia and Europe that entire cultures were changed. 
with the Holy Spirit as their helper, this small band of believers emerged from a prayer meeting one day and started a movement that is still underway. They were people of such impact, the Bible describes them as those who turned the world upside down. Uh, that's who the Holy Spirit was to them. Who is he to us? The Holy Spirit is God, our helper. Got it? You with me? Come on, talk to me, man. That's, the theology. That's a little bit of theology past. We're going to get a little more practical now. You with me? You good? Yes. You survived the theology? <laughs> the Holy Spirit is God, our helper. Let's make it a little more personal. The Holy Spirit is the God who lives in you. So he is always present to help you. All right, and listen, a couple of things you got to get. You're never alone. Got it? You got that? This is one of the ones you got to get. The Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is the God who lives in you. So he's always present to help you. Quick sidebar. Some of you may have just asked this question. How can I know for sure? How can I know that I have received the Holy Spirit, that he actually lives in me? Because Ronnie, got to be frank with you here. Maybe everybody else did, but I didn't. I don't recall an experience where I was in prayer and I heard a mighty windstorm. And I can't recall a time when I saw tongues made out of fire appear in midair and then settle on my head. And I think I'd remember that. I never had an experience like this, so how can I be sure that I have received the Holy Spirit? There is no biblical record that that ever happened again. Apparently, this was a one-time deal. But you may be saying, I, okay, I, got, I get that. But Ronnie, neither have I ever been given the ability to speak in other languages that I haven't been trained in. Now, you do know that did happen again. Acts chapter 10 Acts chapter 19, there were groups of believers who received the Holy Spirit, and the way they knew they received the Spirit is they, began, they got this newfound ability to speak in languages. Languages known to others, but not to them. So that's three times in the book of Acts. Acts 2, 10, and 19. Now, based on the book of Acts, there's some people who believe this, that receiving the Holy Spirit is something that happens after you've been saved. It's something that, that's a second act of God. They believe that speaking in tongues or receiving the gift of tongues, as the Bible eventually describes it, that's the initial evidence that you have received the Holy Spirit. That if you haven't done that, you haven't received the Spirit. And they believe that in a room like this, there are two groups. There are the haves and the have-nots. There are those who have received the Spirit and those who have not received the Spirit. Now, if the New Testament ended with the book of Acts, I might believe that too. But it doesn't. In preparing for this sermon, I'll tell you what I did. I read the whole book of Acts. Curtis wrote down every verse that mentioned the Holy Spirit and what I learned about him. But I kept reading. I read 20 more, 21 more New Testament books. All 21 that followed the book of Acts wrote down every verse the Holy Spirit has mentioned. And what I learned about him, you say, man, you're analytical. I overanalyze everything. But it's good for you that I did. It's good for me. So I got all this, all this information I looked at. Wrote down everything I learned about him. And I need to share three lessons with you that I learned. There's my cue. Uh, I told him, start the music when I want to start going to my three lessons. <laughs> it's like a game show. Here we go. Everybody's thinking. We got the music going. Now, I want to tell you why I'm doing this. Because somebody's sitting here, and you don't know if you've received the Holy Spirit or not. You don't know. Because you, you've kind of, you've heard some of these things. You've, you, you've listened to some of these things. And so, I'm doing this for your sake. I can't afford for anybody watching the sermon, listening to it on podcasts, or anybody sitting here to walk out of here going, I don't know if he really lives in me and is really present to help me because I don't know if he's in there. I, listen, we're going to put that to bed this morning, Okay. 
And I want to preface this by saying this. I'm not saying this to create a controversy, any division in, in God's church. And, and what I'm going to share with you, I do with great respect for anybody who believes different from, differently from me. And there are people who do, and I get that. But here's lesson number one. Ready? It is possible to receive the Holy Spirit without receiving the gift of tongues. You got it? As a matter of fact, there are probably far more people who receive the Holy Spirit who never receive the gift of tongues. You know, I, I run into people who go, that gift ceased, it doesn't, it, it's not in operation anymore. You know what? I'm not one of those guys. I don't know that. How would I know that? I have other guys, if, if, if somebody comes up there and said they spoke in tongues, they'd be like, you did wrong. I'm not saying that. I don't know that. If you were to come to me after service and go, I, sometimes I speak in tongues and I pray. I'm not going to put an X on you and go to Pastor Tim and go, weirdo. Weird, Tim. Watch them. I'm not one of those guys. You understand what I'm saying? However, I got to tell you that I disagree with those who tell me. Listen, I'm not condemning anybody that believes that or criticizing them, but I don't like to be looked down on as a second-class believer because I've never spoken in tongues. Oh, he's one of those guys who doesn't have the Spirit. No, don't, don't tell me that. Is that a little bit combative you know, the way I just said it? I didn't mean it to be. I'm not looking down on you. You don't look down on me. So, where do you, you get, where do you get this, Ronnie? Acts chapter 2. Matter of fact, note takers, write these down. Acts chapter 2, verse 14 through 21, and verse 38 and 39. Peter explained to those Jews that day how the Galileans could all of a sudden speak 15 different foreign languages. He said, this is the fulfillment of a biblical prophecy. He quoted from the Old Testament book of Joel. And he said, long ago, God planned that there would come a time where he would pour out his spirit on everybody who called on him to be saved. He said, not only did he plan it, he promised it. So here's a fact from the pages of the Bible. God wants every believer to receive the Holy Spirit. You with me? He wants every believer to receive the Holy Spirit. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 30. You're writing that down? You're writing it? This is what Paul said in the Bible. God never wanted every believer to receive the gift of tongues. How do you reconcile that? He wants every believer to receive the Holy Spirit, but not receive the gift of tongues. How then can tongues be the initial evidence that someone has received the Holy Spirit? Can't be. Not always. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 22. You got it? Paul said, tongues are for a sign, which means evidence. There you go, preacher Ronnie. Tongues are evidence. And then he says this, but not to believers. You say, he did not. He did Tongues are evidence, but not to believers. So how then could tongues be the only evidence, initial evidence, that someone has received the Holy Spirit? It can't be. You with me? Now all I'm doing is trying to prove to you that He's in you. Second lesson I learned was this. There aren't two groups of believers, the haves and the have-nots. Those who have the Holy Spirit and those that don't. That doesn't exist. Something occurred to me as I read the writings of Paul, James, John, Peter, Jude. All of those men wrote with absolute certainty that 100% of the believers to whom they were writing were indwelt by the Spirit. They never prefaced a statement by saying, okay, to those of you who have received the Spirit, here are my instructions. And to those of you who have not received the Spirit, then you've got a different set of instructions. There nowhere in the epistles do any of those writers go, if you haven't received the Spirit, you better, and here's how you do it. They always wrote under the impression they all are indwelt by the Spirit. And then here's a big one, Romans chapter 8, verse 9. You're writing this down, right? This is what Paul said. You ready? I'm telling you, this is not Ronnie Hodge. This is not Hodgeism. This is not a gold of quarterism. This came out of the Bible. Paul said, if you belong to God, the Spirit of God lives in you. Period. If you belong to God, lesson three. I'm about to get off my little theological rant again. We're going to get back to what's practical. Third lesson, we receive the Holy Spirit the moment we were saved. In his writings, I found six times where Paul stated very clearly, his when you receive the Spirit. I'm going to read one. Romans chapter 8, verse number 15. Look at this. We receive the Holy Spirit 
That's not the translation I'm reading out of. I have no idea where it comes. But you see, the, you see this? Oh, that's my lesson. Where's the, oh, maybe I didn't put the verse in there. Here it goes. Romans 8, 15. Oh, yeah, it is. There it is. God, I'm so confused. It's, you know what? Age is a bad thing. It's just a nasty thing. <laughs> Age and technology, they mix like oil and water. You, you with me? Look, up, look what Paul said. You received God's Spirit when, you ask? No. When you spoke in tongues, no. When he adopted you as his children. Couldn't be clearer. The moment you became a child of God, you received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Settled. He moved into your body permanently. Therefore, back to the message, you're not alone. You're never alone. And why, Ronnie, has he moved into my body? The Holy Spirit lives in you, so He is always present to help you. No matter what you're facing, no matter where you are, He's right there, ready and available and willing to help you. Now, this ought to raise a question in your mind. I got all kind of time. <laughs> How's He going to help us, Ronnie? Well, before we get to how He's going to help you, can I just elaborate for a minute on how He's already helped us? Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse 8 through 11, that the Holy Spirit is the one who made sure that somebody got to you with the gospel of Christ. He made sure that happened. It wasn't a coincidence that one night your parents wanted to watch the Billy Graham crusade. And you're like, come on, man, gun smoke's on. And you know, I say, I'm really dating myself, Mike. I'm really dating myself. But you're thinking, I, I don't want to watch Billy Graham. But you did because they made you. And guess what? If you listen to Billy Graham, you heard the gospel. Or maybe had parents that loved you enough to tell you about Jesus. Maybe they took you to church and there was a Sunday school teacher who was, she was faithful. Or there was a pastor. Or there was a friend you worked with. But the Holy Spirit is the one who engineered the circumstances that made sure there was somebody in your path who told you about Jesus. He did that. He's the one who gave you the assurance that that message is true. The reason you came to believe that that was the truth, that Jesus did come, die, was resurrected, and could save you, is he's the one that worked in your mind and said, that's true, and you went, I guess that's the truth. He's the one that continued to work in you so that you came to a point in your life where you went, you know what? It's what I need. may not be what I want, but it's what I need. And Trina kept working, and it kept working until you came to the point you said to yourself, it's not on what I need, it's what I want. He did that. It didn't just happen on your own. He was engineering all this inside of you. And I'll tell you what he did. He kept nurturing and working with your belief in all these facts until they evolved into something called faith. And now you didn't just believe the facts. You were willing to depend, you know, stake eternity on them. And your faith acted and you accepted Christ. And the moment you accepted Christ, you know what the Holy Spirit did for you? He raised you from spiritual death to spiritual life. He did that. He did all of that. And according to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22, and the book of Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verse 14, you write writing, right? Are you, can y'all remember all this? You know what it says the Holy Spirit is doing for you now? He's the guarantee that everything God has promised you, you will eventually get. He's referred to as the first installment. He's referred to as the down payment. But he's not only doing that, he's acting as the seal, the mark on you, identifying you as God's property, bought and paid for. Those are the things that he has already do, had done for you. Now, back to the question. What, in what ways will the Holy Spirit help me? Okay, up to this point in my study, I've identified at least 52 things the Holy Spirit would do for us. You ready? Note takers. Number one. It's going to take a while. <laughs> I'm kidding. We don't have time this morning to complete that list. Therefore, I'm going to start a class this Wednesday night, August 21st, entitled, The God We Forget. In this class, we're going to learn how the Holy Spirit helps us. Probably won't get to all 52. We're going to get to some major ones. 
But we're going to learn what we have to do to acquire his help. Because I think I've come to learn this. In my years of being a Christian, he won't force his help on us. We have to learn how to cooperate. So we're going to learn that together. This class is going to take place three consecutive Wednesday evenings right here in this auditorium. Go to Corner Church. We're going to start at 6.30 sharp. You'll be gone by 7.30, I promise. Child care is going to be provided. And here's what, if you're coming, here's what I need you to do. Bring a Bible. And bring some means of making notes. And until then, I want you to remember this. The one who stretched out the heavens like a canopy and flung stars into the night sky and knows every one of those stars by name. Beverly, he is the one who is now living in you. The one who made a highway through the Red Sea Rain bread out of heaven every morning for 40 years. Brought enough water out of a rock to quench the thirst of the nation. And he's the one who is now living in you. The one who turned the walls of Jericho into dust. Made the sun stand still in the sky and enabled a boy to kill a giant with a rock. James... He's the one who now lives in you. The one who brought Jesus into this world by enabling a virgin to conceive without the aid of a man and then brought him back into the world by raising him from the dead. Sammy, he's the one who now lives in you. So I got a question for you. If he's the one living in you and he's the one who helps you, what can't you overcome? What battle can't you win? What enemy can't you vanquish? What situation can't you get out of? What is it you just can't get over? What challenge do you need to shy away from? You know what I'm thinking? We don't need to read another self-help book. We don't need to listen to another, mo another motivational speaker. We don't need to just try a little harder. And not necessarily do we need to join a support group. Maybe we need him. Maybe we need him to help us by resurrecting a dead marriage. Or delivering us from the snare of addiction. Maybe we need him to give us the ability to forgive somebody who wounded us deeply. Maybe we need him to mend a heart that's been broken, shattered into pieces. If so, I got good news. The Holy Spirit lives in you. So He is always present to help you. Therefore, you're not alone. Want to know more about the Holy Spirit? I'll see you here Wednesday night. Let's pray together. Father, you are gracious. And you are generous. And we think about being saved, we think about incredible gifts like forgiveness. We think about heaven. Lord, maybe we don't think about the Holy Spirit as often as we should. But what a gift! A live in helper who can do anything, who knows everything.
I think about what Jesus said when he talked to those men. He said, the world doesn't recognize him because they aren't looking for him. You know, when I pray, God, as a result of this sermon this morning and maybe the class that we're about to do, I pray that we'll become a people who do recognize him because we learn to look for him. In our generation, God, I tell you what, I think would do our churches a world of good. I think it would be a cure-all. If we would just allow the Holy Spirit to do the things that He alone can do, what a difference I think it would make. Well, thank you for our day. Pray your will be done in each and every life sitting here, each and every life listening to the sermon. Be pleased in Christ's name. Amen. You are good to go. And I'll let you out a lot quicker than Tim McCall would. Remember that. <laughs> <laughs>